everyone and welcome to my studio. Happy New Year. My name is Karen Margulis and I have a new video for you and I have a great tip to get you started for the new year and have you paint more often. I think one of the problems that we run into when it comes time to paint is that we often take too long to figure out what to paint. We go down to our studio and we putter around and we organize things and we try to find supplies and then try to figure out what to paint. And then before you know it, our time is up and that window of opportunity is closed and we haven't done a thing that was productive. So I have a solution that will help you paint more often and spend less time puttering around and more time at the easel. And that is keeping an inspiration jar. And what I have is a little jar and inside the jar I keep several reference photos that I cut out and they're all things that I know that I want to paint at some point. So they're all photos of things that I want to paint. I just don't ever know when I want to paint them. Put it in the inspiration jar and when it's time to paint, pull one out. You know it's something you want to paint, but now you have to paint that. And oftentimes what it does is it kind of greases the wheel and you get motivated and you and maybe that painting will inspire another painting or maybe you decide you know what I didn't really want to paint that after all I'm gonna pick another one but what it does is it breaks through that kind of barrier that prevents you from starting it makes you choose it chooses for you and then you have to paint and uh, so I, I think it's a great idea It's really helped me um, no, notice though that the, I use very small reference photos. That's the way I like to paint because I don't want to see detail. I only want to be inspired and I want to kind of jump start my imagination. If however you don't like to work from small photos or maybe you never have, you would rather work from your tablet or larger photos, what you can do is simply write down on slips of paper the things that you want to paint. And you might even note, it, note a certain photo that you might have on your tablet that you want to paint. Put those in your inspiration jar and select from those. And so it really does the same thing. So keep an inspiration jar. It will help you paint more often and spend less time puttering around. What I want to show with you, share with you today, my very first painting of 2020. And I'm going to do a demonstration and I'm going to use the inspiration jar to pick the subject for today's painting. So I want you to stick around to the end of the video because it's going to go through some ugly stages where you might think that's not going to turn into anything. But if you stick around to the end, hopefully it will turn into something and you'll and hopefully you'll be uh, inspired to do your own painting today. So be sure to stick around to the end uh, because, again, it goes through ugly stages. All right, so here I go. I'm going to pick something randomly out of my inspiration jar. And I have selected something that I've been wanting to paint that does not look very inspiring. So can you see? see the photo. <clears throat> Let me just give you a little background. This is a scene from my trip to France a couple summers ago. It is a meadow which you can't really see in the photo but I remember being there of Queen Anne's Lace. It was like the mother load of Queen Anne's Lace. I, I don't think I've ever seen so much all in one place and it was really really inspiring for me because that's my favorite flower to paint. So that's what the scene is. Now I have to make it into an interesting painting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just use my black board here and do a very quick thumbnail so I can kind of get an idea of the big shapes that I want to use. And I like the shapes that are in the photo. I like that the horizon is up high because it kind of lets me play with the, the, the flowers in the field. I like this big dark shape of a tree, but I would pull it down just a little bit. I like that there are other trees in the, in the far distance, and even further back there's a, a mountain shape way back, so that's going to allow me to create some depth. I do know that I want to rearrange the flowers so that they kind of lead us through that field, so I'm going to make a line just to represent where I want the eye to go. And I'm going to take this little thumbnail and just simply transfer this idea to my paper. What you're noti Notice that I'm using the reference photo just as inspiration. I'm 
going to make some changes, although slight changes, but their changes are based upon what I remember from being there, which is why I like to work from my own photos. There's actually two levels of that mountain shape, so I'm going to do that. Anytime I can create multiple levels or multiple planes, it helps create depth. All right, and then I'm going to make this leading line. And I'm going to put in just a few of those Queen Anne's legs. I'm going to pull a few up in front of the mountains because we are look the point of view is that we are in the, this field of flowers and we're looking back into the distance through the flowers. So I'm going to put some flowers along this line. That's how I'm arranging them. I'm not arranging them the way they are in the photo because they're just too random. It, it's too busy and it just won't make a good composition. The next thing that I need to do is block in the painting. I'm working on a piece of UART sanded paper. It's the 400 grit. And I want to block it in so that I cover the whole paper with one thin layer of pastel. And the reason why I want to do this is because I don't want to fight the light tone of the paper. Having little specks of light will be a distraction. And it also makes me paint with too much pastel to cover them up, and then I end up with mud. So I'm going to do a very thin layer using some hard pastels, and I have a random selection of new pastels. So I've selected four different hard pastels to do the blocking. I'm going to start with the darkest areas. The darkest areas are these upright planes, which are this tree shape. So I'm going to very lightly put in this dark blue, with the dark blue new pastel, to put in some of these upright train, planes, rather, these tree shapes. The next thing that I want to do is block in the light areas, and in this case the light area is going to be, I want to do a little bit lighter, the light area is the sky, so I'm using a pale pink for the sky. I'm going to make a blue sky, but I'll have the pale pink as a kind of an undertone. Now you might be saying, but aren't the flowers light? And they are light, but I'm going to start with them being a little bit darker than I want them to end up. Um, so you'll see how that works. Then I have to address color in the, in the meadow, in the field. And I know that there's going to be a lot of green, so I want to underpaint with something that will work well with the green to kind of give us a little relief from the green. So I'm using some oranges. Here's a darker value, and this kind of goes along with that zigzag shape. Put a little at the bottom as well. And then I'm going to underpaint the rest of the field with orange. Because I know that orange is going to make the greens vibrate or exciting. So I'll put a little orange. What do we have left? We have that distant mountain shape. And I know that it's way in the distance, so it's got a very blue tone to it. I'm going to make it a little bit more vibrant than I want it to end up. There's one thing about pastels. You can start dark and rich and vibrant, and you can always tone it down as you paint. So I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm also going to make this area a little bit darker. I'm going to actually take some of that dark blue and put a layer of the dark blue on top of the orangey brown. What about the flowers themselves? Why don't we underpaint those with a peachy color? Again, a little bit darker than the sky. I'm only going to put in a few of the larger flowers. Uh, the smaller ones we'll be able to put on top of the colors once we put them down. Alright, so we have another step. You can still see a lot of the paper showing through, and again, that would be a distraction. So what I want to do is I'm going to take a piece of, of pipe insulation foam, the thing that you wrap around your pipes to keep them from freezing, and I'm going to use this as a tool to rub in that first layer. So I'll start with the darker areas here, and the darker areas in the meadow. And I'm basically trying to rub all of this in so I end up with a very soft, out of focus underpainting. I'm going to move that 
piece of foam around so that I can get a clean, <coughs> excuse me, a clean side. There you go. Now everything is rubbed in and I have a very soft and out of focus underpainting. Now this is the ugly stage that I'm talking about. So keep with me because I'm going to now go in and take out my softer pastels and start to refine the painting. The reason why I like to work with something that is out of focus is because then I have the freedom to decide where I want to put the focus and where I want to put the detail. So I'm going to take out my pastels and I'm working today with, where does this one go? My set of uh, Terry Ludwig floral landscape pastels. And this is the set that I uh, curated and I'm going to use this set exclusively. I will uh, go to the hard pastels at the very end for some final detail, but I'm going to start with these pastels. And I'm going to start by reinforcing the dark areas because, as you can see, when I rubbed it all in, I kind of took away the uh, intensity of the darks. So I'm going to reintroduce some dark. This is a dark blue so that I can get better contrast by having my darks nice and dark. Now one thing that I like to do is I like to layer my darks. I don't want to have just one dark. So in other words, I didn't make this dark green. I started with dark blue and now I'm going to add a layer of dark burgundy. And I'm using a very light touch because I want all of the colors to work together. So a very light touch. And you can see that I'm creating this pathway of dark that leads us up through the, the meadow. Let's add another layer of dark. How about a dark purple? Let's add a dark purple. Just to add a little bit of color so that the mass of green is not so boring. And then finally, it is green after all, so we do need to add some green. So I have a nice dark, that's not a dark green, that's a dark blue. Let's get that nice dark green in there. Now everything at this moment is looking much like a blob. But we have to block it in with big simple shapes and then we will start to refine it and add the light. So I need to add light to the sides of the trees so that we can have a little bit of volume. So I need to figure out where the light source is, where's the light coming from. <clears throat> and if I look at my photo, I see that the right hand side of some of the trees are lit by the sun. So the sun must be somewhere over on the left. So I'm gonna make a little sun to remind me to add light to the left side of the tree shapes, which I'm doing right now. I don't want to add light everywhere because if I add light everywhere, what ends up happening is it looks flat. And we don't want it to look flat. Just putting some of the green down in the field. Now, this grouping of trees is supposed to be in front of this trees which are in the distance. Uh, what I've done is I've made them all the same color and value. That may, makes them feel like they're on the same plane. So I need to push these back a little bit. So I'm going to add a cooler blue-green and I need to lighten them up a little bit. So I'm going to use a lighter dull green. To push them into the distance. Now what I've done is I've created kind of a snake of green and I don't want that, that's boring, so I'm going to use the mountain color that's in the distance to break that shape up. So I'm going to do some negative painting around these distant trees to give it a more interesting shape. And I'm using a blue, a gray down blue for that. And I need to lighten it up just a touch. It's a little bit too dark. Let's see, that's a little bit lighter. Just adding some of that into the mountain shape. And I'm breaking up this big bush shape 
by adding some of the mountain color back there so it's not just a big boring shape. It could probably be a little bit lighter. Let's add a little bit of uh, blue gray, blue violet, and that kind of pushes it back. See now how I've got it feeling like it's going into the distance? So the next thing I'm going to do is address the sky. Uh, I'm going to address the sky because it sets the whole mood and tone of the painting. And I know that it was a blue sky day, but it was kind of a hazy blue. So I'm going to use kind of a, a light blue. And I have another light blue that has a little bit more gray down quality to it. So I'm going to put that in there and just let these colors mingle together. Now when I get to my tree shape, I'm going to carve into the tree using this blue kind of like a, uh, doing a wood carving. This is the shape, and now I'm using the color that's behind it, the blue, as a knife. And I'm going in and gradually carving into it to make it a much more interesting shape. And a lot of times I'll have to go back and forth and, and carve away, and then come back and uh, add more green. Oops, I just covered up my flower. I'm adding a lighter blue closer to the horizon. And then finally at the horizon, I'm going to add a pale yellow because there's often a little bit of haze at the horizon. So I'm going to add a pale yellow right in there. And I'm going to leave the edge where the sky meets the mountain very soft so that it just stays back into the distance. All right, so there's my sky. I missed a spot right here. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the field and then finally the flowers. And you might be thinking, well, the, the, the painting is all about the flowers. How come you waited so long to do them? And that is because they are the icing on the cake, or, or you might want to say the sprinkles on the cupcake. They are the final details. We have to set everything up before we can add in those flowers. So what I'm doing now is I'm adding some back, some of the peachy, orangey colors that I had in my underpainting. And this becomes what I like to call the dirt. And if you've seen any of my other videos, then you've heard me talk about dirt. And to me, dirt is colors that I use underneath the final local color just to add more interest. So I'm using some of these peachy colors as my dirt, and then I'm going to put the green on top of it, and so hopefully that will make the green a little bit more interesting. So one thing, now I have everything in place. I, I put in an orange back here that I didn't really like, so I'm going to make it a little bit of a lighter version of the peach. I'm going to go back and fix that. I don't like that orange color. And then I need to fix the tree shapes right in there. I'll just refine that a little bit better. All right. So now I'm to the point where I can work on the greens and the flowers. I'm going to do something first, and then I'm going to go ahead and work on the flower, work on the green. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pale uh, mauvey color, a little pale mauve. And I'm going to use it to block in the flower shapes. Remember I said I was going to start with a darker flower color and then gradually lighten it? Well, that's what I'm doing right now. So now I have those flowers in place. I think I probably need a little guy over here to balance it out. Now what I'm going to do is get ready to put the green stuff. But I'm going to take a little bit of workable fixative. This is Blair Very Low Odor workable fixative. And uh, I'm going to spray it very quickly and very lightly. And now normally, if you have a very small enclosed room, you're going to want to spray that fixative outside. I have a large room with windows open, so I can kind of get away with it, but use care. And we're going to let that dry. And you might be wondering, well, why am I spraying fixative, it's workable fixative, but why would I even bother with that? Well, if you notice, it sort of darkened everything. 
made it a little bit duller. That's okay because now I'm, I have fixed in place those darks and I, when I come back over it with the lighter colors it will at, allow the darks to kind of peek through and create a little bit more depth within the, the field. So it's dry now and I'm going to start in with the greens. I'm going to take a dull light green and paint the very distant green parts of this field. And I'm going to allow some of it to peek through the, the tree shapes right in here. And I'm going to choose another dull neutral green and add another layer. I don't want to cover up all of the peach though. I want some of the peach to peek through because that's going to help give that field some interest. Then I have another kind of lighter, cooler green that I'm going to work into the distant field as well. Pull it down just a little bit. And then I'm going to take a dark, my darker green to reinforce that dark suggested pathway. Now, one thing I don't know if you noticed, but in the distant grasses I was using horizontal strokes. That's because the, they're further back, they're in the distance. But as I come forward, I'm using vertical strokes. That's because in the foreground we can see the direction of the grasses. So I'm going to make that change to help create that illusion of depth. Now I'm going to take a brighter green and kind of knit these areas together. And where it kind of where the upright meets the horizontal, I'm kind of just being a little bit messy with my strokes to kind of create that transition. That's a brighter green. What else do I have in my arsenal? I have a warmer green. I can use warmer greens in the foreground area. What else do I have? I have, what is this one? Here's another darker, but a brighter green. I can use that. But notice how I'm not covering everything up. Remember, I want to allow that underpainting to do some of the work for me. And I have an even warmer, more yellowy green. And we're going to put some of that in the foreground area. See how it starts to brighten up the grasses? But do you see how the dark is underneath and it kind of holds it all together, kind of like glue? That dark is acting like a glue. One thing that I do need to do is add a little bit more light to my tree shapes. I've kind of neglected them. And I think I'm going to add a cooler blue to the shadow side of these trees because they're fairly in the distance. And a little bit more light. Okay, now finally we get to work on the flowers. We've already given them one layer. Let's go ahead and add another layer, this time a lighter green. Kind of a neutral green. I love the neutral greens. We need to have the neutral greens along with the bright intense greens because if there are no neutral greens everything is screaming for attention. Notice I'm adding a few more flowers than I had originally. If you might be wondering, is how do I know where to put them? I'm just putting them where they seem to make sense for the rhythm and balance of the composition. So remember, I want to pull your eyes around, so I want you to kind of go here, and then back to here, and then finally up and out of the painting. Alright, so now we have two layers on those flowers. Let's give them another layer before we... Um, let's add a little bit of a pale peach. Another thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to make sure that all the flowers are not sitting on top of the grasses, which they are now. See how they're all sitting on top of the grasses? When we have it like this, then it looks like we pasted them on. So in a minute, we're going to adjust them so that some of them are going to be hidden in the grasses. Also, if we want to have some of the flowers kind of hiding in the shadows, why not? That might be too dark. Why not take a blue-green? Let's do a little bit lighter. 
put a blue green and these will represent those flowers that are kind of hidden in the shadows. Again, we're going to have to cover some of these up because right now they're all sitting on top. All right, let's brighten them up even more. Let's see. I'm going to add another layer of light green on the flowers. A lot of times we think, oh, Queen Anne's Lace, those are white. But if I was just to use a white pastel, they would not be very interesting. I'm just making some random green flower marks. Right now I'm feeling like I have too many things going on, so we're going to have to adjust that <clears throat> when we add some of the grasses back in. Finally, we need to get what I like to call turn on the lights, so we need to add a lighter side to the flowers. So where are the flowers catching the light? Mostly on the right side of the flowers, on the top right. They're not all catching the light because some of them are going to be hidden in the grasses. Left. What? Left. left. Right, left. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, now they're starting to come alive. What I want to do now is add in some, <coughs> excuse me, some of the grasses. I'm going to put in some more of this warmer yellowy green, and I'm going to very lightly pull it on top of some of the flowers so that I can hide them. So we got to put them in and we got to take them out. I'm also going to take a little bit more of the fixative, give it a spray, and I like sometimes to splatter it because then I get some interesting effects. I'm going to let that dry. I'm still fighting those little bits of paper on the tree in the distance, so I'm using my finger to tap it away ever so slightly, and then I'll come back <clears throat> with some of the green. Here we go. Now let's go ahead and add some chunkier grass. And then we have a problem. And that is, these flowers are just floating. Where are they going? They're like balloons floating away. So we need to ground them and we need to create <clears throat> some stems. I'm looking for, I'm taking out my hard pastels and I'm looking for a dark uh, green. Before I do that, I want to just give them a little base, a little darkening under the bottom so that the stems have something to hold on to. Let's just darken them on ever so slightly. And we can come in and draw a few of those wonderful linear marks that we have on Queen Anne's Lace. And then we're going to come in and draw some stems. Now, we don't want balloons, so I want to use a very nice kind of uh, flowing painterly line. So I want broken lines. Instead of stiff lines, I want soft, broken lines. So now our flowers have stems. They have these little bits hanging off of them. And now the fun part, creating a better illusion of grass. So I'm going to take some of these new pastels, these hard pastels, and I'm going to paint in some linear marks using broken lines. So basically I'm pressing and I'm releasing, I'm pressing and I'm releasing, so that the pastel kind of dances around creating some linear marks to suggest the grasses. And what I like to do is use a variety of those greens and I also like to pull some of them up over the, the uh, trees and mountains so that we get that perspective of being in the meadow looking up. Now I could go on and on with this and get carried away, but the main thing is you want to, when you start doing the grass marks, is you want to step away frequently and observe because before you know it, you end up with way too many grasses and much, too much detail, and then it, it kind of is overkill. So be careful when you're at this stage. One other thing that I like to do is take the hard pastels, or the softer ones, back out and kind of make some chunkier marks to represent some of the thicker bits and pieces that you find in a busy meadow. The final thing that I'm going to do is 
look at where the eye is going and add some little touches of spice. So something exciting for the eye to look at. So I'm going to take a little piece of red and put it back there in the distance and just kind of rub it so that when you go back there you see something. And a, I remember that in this meadow there were also some purple flowers, so I want to introduce a couple of little purple things in there, just randomly placed in there, so not really random, I'm trying to get them so that your eye picks up on them and follows them through into the painting. Let's do another, another one right in here. I'm not sure I want that red mark to be as prominent, so I'll just tap it away and cover it up so it's just kind of there, but not there, if you know what I mean. It's just um, kind of a, a little color note that you see when you get to the back into the distance of the painting. The last thing that I'm going to do is really brighten up the light because I'm kind of feeling like it's lost in the sky, so I'm using the lightest light that I have and just adding a few touches of it here and there and a few little light bits, kind of like baby's breath, sprinkle them around and I'm going to call this one done. So I hope you've enjoyed this demo. It was a lot of fun choosing something from the inspiration jar. I didn't really have to overthink what I'm going to paint, just pick it, paint it and have fun with it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, if, you, if you do, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Join me on Patreon if you want to see more in-depth lessons and videos. So thanks for tuning in today and happy painting.